A very good morning students. Today we'll be learning about services. Tertiary activity consists of all the service occupations, transport, communication, trade, health, education, and administration are important examples of tertiary activities. These tertiary activities help in the development of the primary and secondary sectors. These activities by themselves do not produce a good, but they are an aid or a support for the production process. So these are also known as support services. This sector provides services to the general population and to businesses. Activities associated with this sector include retail and wholesale sales, transportation and distribution, entertainment, movies, television, radio, music, theater, etc. Restaurants, clerical services, media, tourism, insurance, banking, healthcare and law. The tertiary sector covers a wide range of activities from commerce to administration, transport, financial and real estate activities, business and personal services, education, health and social work. Objectives After reading this particular chapter, you will be able to understand the meaning, concepts, classification and importance of the tertiary activities and service communications and also trade. Business activity is divided into three categories, primary, secondary and tertiary. Primary activities include extracting raw materials. Secondary activities include manufacturing and construction. Tertiary activities are based on providing a service. In order to completely understand tertiary activities, we must be familiar with primary and secondary activities as they are directly linked. So the tertiary activities are service based and provide non-tangible value to the customers. For example, companies working in this area include banks, consultancy and public transport. Most companies involved in tertiary activities do not have operations associated with primary or secondary activities. Let's look at the concept of tertiary activities and service. Tertiary activities. These activities include all those actions related to delivery of primary or secondary production items to consumers, industrialists, transportation, communication and communication of goods, distribution and services of institutions and individuals under such activities, such as merchants, brokers, banks, insurance, social services and exchanges are included. From this point of view, teaching, politics, research, etc. are now fourth activities. Now the activities of human beings on the ground are considered to bring about a complete change in the basis of economic and economic activities in many ways. And this is why in the field of economic geography, the importance of such activities of man is increasing rapidly because he is not only satisfied with his life, his subsistence or his present form, but he was constantly striving for better living system. Knowledge of the events of the entire world today is made available directly to humans and researchers in their own home or workshop through the latest communication mediums so that there can be no hindrance in the continuous development of economic activities. On the economic activities of any country, various level of means of production, trade, commerce, transport and communication system that is natural environment climate, structure, minerals, soil, surface, condition, bio world, etc. Due to such facts, the field of economic geography is connected in many ways to the facts of physical geography. Likewise, changing political geography can also be seen to have a clear impact on the level patterns of the economic activities developed in the countries, such as the economic activities of socialist and capitalist countries. It must be kept in mind here that the political geography is variable. So economic activities are also essentially necessary to remain constantly dynamic in terms of time and area, such as the production, distribution and consumption of agricultural, mineral and industrial resources. Commerce, business, transport and communication are properly studied. All these elements can be called the lifelines of economic geography. In North America, the science is also called the geoeconomic or the geoeconomies or economic geography. Now let's look at the classification and importance of the tertiary activities. 
Tertiary activities are generally divided into four categories, social services, distribution services, services to companies and services to consumers. So social services are provided by public and private sectors and they include activities related to administration, education and healthcare. The distribution services are activities that deal with the movement of people, goods and information from one place to another. Services to companies are the activities that are contracted to other companies or organizations and services to consumers include catering businesses, repairs, cleaning and hotels. Now let's look at what is communication. This is one of the types of services. So human beings have used different methods, long distance communications of which telegraph and the telephone were important. The telegraph was instrumental in colonization of American West. During the early and the mid 20th century, the American telegraph and telephone company enjoyed a monopoly over the United States of America's telephone industry. In fact, the telephone became a critical factor in the urbanization of America. Firms centralized their functioning at city headquarters and located their branch offices in smaller towns. Even today, the telephone is the most commonly used mode. In developing countries, the use of cell phones made possible by satellites is important for rural connectivity. Today, there is a phenomenal pace of development. The first major breakthrough is the use of optic fiber cables. Faced with mounting competition, telephone companies all over the world soon upgraded their copper cable systems to include optic fiber cables. These allow large quantities of data to be transmitted rapidly, securely and are virtually error free. With the digitization of information in 1990s, telecommunications slowly merged with computers to form integrated networks named as internet. Trade. Trade means exchange of goods. Traders assen trades essential because nature has not provided resources to all regions equally. The unequal distribution of resources is the basis of trade. When people produce a circular quantity, they tend to exchange the surplus production with commodities they lack. When human wants, limited trade develop locally or regionally. An increase in population, higher living standards or natural calamities like a drought, demand imports of goods from distant places. Four factors or conditions initiate grade one to will the exchange goods. Mutual contact between regions of all countries. Trade also helps in surplus production. Variation in the commodity. Let's look at what is the meaning of trade. Trade is one of the most important activities of a man. It is the most important aspect of the world economic organization. It is a significant aspect in the relation of one another, one country with another. On it, to large degrees at the well-being of the people of a country, the standard of living. Although many conditions favor or hinder international trade communication throughout its long history, foreign trade has rested fundamentally on basis of there is regular distribution of natural resources and on the ability of people to use technology in their development. People trade to obtain commodities they cannot produce themselves or things they can purchase elsewhere at lower cost than they can produce them. Trade is simply the exchange of goods and commodities that takes place at any level. The earliest form of trade was barter in which goods were exchanged for goods. The barter system is still carried on in some primitive societies and shows the underdeveloped economy of such societies. The barter system of trade has three characteristics. Let's look at them. Firstly, it depends upon two people buying mutually able to satisfy one another's wants. Secondly, a rate of exchange has to be determined before transaction can take place. And thirdly, the exchange of large for small commodities is difficult. Thus, the present day trade of these difficulties is mostly done through the medium of currency. Let's look at the types of trade. On a large scale, world trade has become of two types, internal or domestic trade and international or ex external trade. Let's look at them individually, internal trade. 
Internal trade is also known as home trade. It is conducted within the political and geographical boundaries of a country. It can be at local level, regional level or national level. Hence, trade carried on among traders of Delhi, Mumbai, etc. is called home trade. Internal trade can be further subdivided into two groups, wholesale trade. Firstly, wholesale trade, it involves buying in large quantities from producers or manufacturers and selling in lots to retailers for resale to consumers. The wholesaler is a link between manufacturer and retailer. A wholesaler occupies prominent position since manufacturers as well as retailers both are dependent upon them. Wholesaler acts as an intermediary between producers and retailers. The next form is a retail trade. It involves buying in smaller lots from the wholesalers and selling in very small quantities to the consumers for personal use. The retailer is just the last link in the chain of distribution. He establishes the link between the wholesalers and the consumers. There are different types of retailers, small as well as large. Small scale retailers include hawkers, peddlers, general shops, etc. Well, that was about the internal trade. Now let's look at the international trade. External trade also called as foreign trade. It refers to buying and selling between two or more countries. For instance, if Mr. X, who is a trader from Mumbai, sells his goods to Mr. Y, another trader from New York, then this is an example of foreign trade. External trade can also be further subdivided into three particular groups. Firstly, the export trade. When a trader from home country sells his goods to a trader located in another country, it's called export trade. For example, a trader from India sells his goods to a trader located in China. The next type is the import trade. When a trader in home country obtains or purchases goods from a trader located in another country, it is called import trade. For example, a trader from India purchases goods from a trader located in China. Next, we have the interport trade. When goods are imported from one country and then re-exported after some processing, it's called interport trade. In brief, it can be also called as re-export of the processed imported goods. So the two types of trade we have done. Now let's look at the significance of trade in regional and national economy. So trade is a symptom of civilization. The economic progress of a nation is based upon trade. One nation exchanges its Hercules production for the circulars of another nation. In this way, everybody tends to produce only that community for which nature has given him the greatest capacity. Climate, topography and social organization determine the capacity of production. They also, on the other hand, determine the need for commodities. Successful trade provides for developing or emerging nations a source of foreign currency to help a nation's balance of payments. Intra-regional trade refers to trade which focuses on economic exchange primarily between countries of the same region or economic zone. In recent years, countries within economic trade regimes such as ASEAN in Southeast Asia, for example, have increased the level of trade and commodity exchange between themselves, which reduces the inflation and tariff barriers associated with foreign markets resulting in growing prosperity. Trade is an engine to grow. Trade is the most dynamic and policy thirst as an engine to growth according to the current trade and economic theories and received wisdom of modern period. Normative liberal theory since Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations in 1776 portrays a positive link between free trade and economic growth. This is also thrust of the current globalization wave. However, in real world, free trade is rare practice as it is encumbered by many factors and policies. Dependent trade between two trading partners with highly unequal exchange rates and other economic and indirectly working dependency structures of the weaker one is harmful for the latter. With equal economic ranking and specialization and competitive abilities as it prevails between developed countries. Such a trade exchange, economic growth and general well-being. Trade is recognized as an engine for inclusive economic growth and poverty reduction that contributes to the promotion of sustainable development. Trade can also serve as an effective means 
to facilitate the diffusion of technologies around the world, including of vital green technologies. A predictable trading environment can help to promote long-term investments that could further enhance the productive capacity of a country. An increase in exports enhances the country's income growth, at least at the aggregate level, while an increase in the imports at competitive prices can improve consumer surplus and the prospective competitiveness of domestic producers that use imported intermediaries. Market access conditions, both foreign market access for a country's exports and domestic market access for imports are thus an important determinant of the effectiveness of trade as a means of implementation. Trade promotes growth and enhances economic welfare by stimulating more efficient utilization of factor endowments of different regions and by enabling people to obtain goods from sufficient sources of supply. Trade also makes available to people goods which cannot be produced in their country due to various reasons. Trade liberalization is a key element in growth and a sustainable national development strategy. Economic growth occurs at the producer level and perhaps the most powerful incentive for producers to rise productivity is competition. Developed and developing country partners have increased their focus on trade as an integral part of national development strategies and trade related development assistance to support those strategies. Now let's look at the benefits of trade. Benefits of the trade as the trade theory suggests can be derived by developing strong and diverse level of comparative and competitive advantage. No country enjoys absolute advantages of a country have to be constant structural dynamics in the production and export structures. Trade can be the engine of growth only under such dynamic structures and can provide multiple benefits. Firstly, more open liberalized economies on average continue to experience faster and higher growth than less open economies. Trade offset inherent differential factor endowments and scarcities in countries. All countries lack some or the other factors or resources. This inherent scarcity can be offset by trading through outsourcing, that is importing scarce or less available resources from other countries. Japan has been relatively a resource-less country in terms of coal, iron ore, petroleum and other vital factor endowments, but its industrial production structure and vast trading machine have built up to be the second largest global economy after the United States. Trade enhances variety of production structures, diversity of products, and higher factor productivity and efficiency. Outsource items, that is imports, have to be paid for, and therefore exports are required to earn foreign exchange to pay for them. From this increasing competitiveness establishes a virtuous cycle of high trading by expanding production structure and export-import regime with constant quality enhancement. Factors of production are allocated more efficiently in such dynamically expanding economy. Lead factors of economy and well allocated scarce resources dynamize other stagnant and slowly moving subsectors or sectors of the economy, which then try to catch up through these growth impulses. This is the motivation oriented multiplier effect of dynamic lead sector. Consumption demand rises high production leads eventually to per capita income growth in a liberal justice oriented regime in general. People's purchasing power rises to demand more and vary customer goods. Since producing all much varied good is not at all feasible and adventurous in an expanding economy, cheaper and better quality goods are imported. This enhances consumer welfare by increasing choice among goods with often lesser price. People also are motivated to earn more to have higher disposable income. Open trade and import policies also limit the scope for arbitrary exchanges in arbitrary changes in the domestic policies or orienting policies to favor the demands of specific elite or interest and feudal groups as it happened usually in the earlier societies. Free flow of imports, ideas, technology, FDI and other investment resources across the border 
lead to further growth and competitive structures. Imports do not necessarily harm the economy as some still think of the mercantilist ideas. If the import regimes are carefully selected and plucked back into the socio-economic fabric, they provide several advantages. All economies import to build up economic growth and expand their export structures by quantity as well as quality. In this chapter, we try to explain that tertiary activities are service-based and provide non-tangible value to the customers. Example of the companies working in this area include banks, consultancy and public transport. Most companies involved in the tertiary activities do not have operations associated with primary or secondary activities. The region provides services to the general population and businesses. Activities related to this sector include retail and wholesale sales, transportation and distribution, entertainment like cinema, television, radio, music, theatre, etc., restaurants, clerical services, media, tourism, insurance, banking, healthcare, and law.